from Chicago's Can TV. A look at the week's events is reported in the newspapers, in the blogs and online, and on radio and TV. This is Chicago Newsroom. Well, hello there and welcome to the show. So at some point yesterday, we officially crossed the 60 inch mark for snowfall in Chicago. So we're currently the eighth snowiest winter in history and there's more snow coming on Saturday or something. So we'll knock that off. We'll get down to fifth, maybe fourth. But we got a long way to go if we want to knock off the gold that was in 1979 with 89.7 inches. And right here on the show today, we're going to put the challenge out. Let's go for 30 more inches and be the champs. What do you say? Can we do it? 30 more inches? Come on, Chicago, we can do it. All right, listen, on today's show, Governor's Qu Governor Quinn says that the state of the uh, state of Illinois is a lot better than you probably thought it was, although he's going to need a few more weeks to come up with a budget address that would uh, put it just after the primary primary election. And speaking of the primary, if Bill Brady gets lucky on his third try and he becomes the governor of Illinois, it's bad news for all of you layabouts who would rather lie on your couch collecting unemployment and watching canned TV than go out and get a good manufacturing job. And the Dan Webb report is out and it doesn't have too much good stuff to say about the Chicago Police Department or the state's attorney's office, but nothing bad enough to get anybody indicted. And we'll have a look back on the rising number of infant deaths among uh, families who've been in contact with the Department of Children and Family Services. So a lot on the plate today. And we thought we would invite the two busiest reporters in Chicago this week who've been covering all these stories. Tony Arnold, WBEZ. Thanks for okay. coming back again. Thanks. Chris Fusco, Chicago Sun-Times. How are you doing? A couple guys uh, who I really uh, admire who do some very good work. But I want to start off with the quote of the week, which, uh, Tony, you apparently had to yourself for a while there. Uh, the number one issue I run into when I travel around to manufacturing plants, particularly when I ask them, how's it going? They say, I can't hire my people back. They say they're enjoying I'll use their unemploy uh, unemployment insurance. And I can't get them back to work. So we got to motivate people to get back into the workforce. That's the future governor of Illinois, Mr. Brady. Uh, and you were there. You heard him say that with your very own ears. Yeah, this is a this is a debate uh, earlier this week, a Republican debate, and in, in front of uh, the manufacturing crowd. It's it was sponsored. It was put on by manufacturers, and so the crowd was uh, a business crowd, and, and so most of the debate you hear them talking, trying to talk their language, the crowd's language, um, and half of Chicago's media was there. Not so much for the debate, but I think they were trying to look at other candidates, particularly Dan Rutherford, with everything that's going on with with him and Brady at the very end of this thing this this hour long debate we've heard them all give the same answers to the same questions all along <laughs> but there was this new twist on this unemployment question what do you think about Illinois unemployment insurance and you know Bruce Rauner went first and he said I you know I don't hear much about that from issue from uh, manufacturers and Dan Rutherford tried to make the issue about we got to keep people employed to bring down the gun violence in Chicago um, and then <laughs> that's, a, that's, and an then, interesting that's a whole other yeah. thing. And then um, Bill Brady made that comment. It was just kind of passing and they were running out of time. And when they got to Kirk Dillard, he, they just kind of cut him off and he didn't really get a chance to answer. So, uh -huh. so Bill Brady made this comment that he's hearing more than anything else from manufacturers that they want to, that Illinois unemployment is, is basically last for too long and is, is too high. And then he makes, goes on and says that we have to motivate people to, to get back to work as if as if they're not motivated. Um, and so, you know, it, it struck me at the time and I thought that was weird and I wanted to, I, I went back to the office and I listened back again and um, at that point I, I called his campaign and just said, is this right? Is this, this is the number one thing? And, and then he ended up calling me directly and said, you know, it's not the number one thing. I didn't say it was the number one thing. Well, he, he did, <laughs> that's okay, that's, that's not here or there. But he went on to say, you're missing the larger point. The point is, our unemployment benefits are too strong and, and, and people aren't motivated to go, to go back to work. And so this is now, you know, this is something that I don't know if it's going to be, I haven't seen it picked up by the uh, Republican candidates for the primary, but I could certainly see uh, someone like Pat Quinn mm -hmm. um, later on down the, down the campaign here using this, this quote yeah. in, a, in a TV ad. Um, I was I just kind so. of imagining Roger Ailes, you know, as he's sitting writing the morning thing for all the candidates in the country to read and looking at this and saying, where did he get that from? I didn't authorize that. Yeah, <laughs> that's, right. that's a crazy thing he said. Well, the, the one thing, too, is, you know, I really wanted to know from, from Bill Brady, what, what, who's telling you these things? Right. This is something that hasn't right. come up the whole campaign. Yeah. And yeah. now all of a sudden you're saying it's the top issue you're hearing right. from Illinois manufacturers, and, mm -hmm. and we're a manufacturing state. We have plenty of 
those and, and so I, I and he wouldn't he said that he wouldn't tell me who they were just because yeah. they had been told whoever he heard it from has he didn't have the authority to pass it on to reporters so it's it's kind of this mystery thing right now who who all these manufacturers yeah, are yeah. who are well, who are that unhappy with unemployment insurance this whole race i mean if you're at home sitting on your couch reading the paper and watching tv you got to be this is one of the goofier <laughs> political races i think we have ever observed and i'm not covering and, it and we've seen thank a lot heaven. uh <laughs> i'm covering it on the edges yeah. but it's just you know between brady's comment uh the whole drama between uh rutherford and rauner mm -hmm. uh that's playing out mm -hmm. the amount we, which of which we should talk about in case people are not yeah. familiar with well, it I, yeah. I, you know two things i think i think the money that rauner has to play with here just changes the dynamic of the whole race and then you you go on top of that the sparring back and forth i think is kind of it's these storylines are all very confusing, and mm -hmm. I think if you're a voter walking into the box in, in, in a few weeks, you're like, what do, what do I do here? Mm -hmm. I mean, everybody right. is just all over the board. Yeah. yeah, and when you hear, when it comes down to actual policies, it's, they are, a lot of them are very similar on a lot of things. There's not much to differentiate them other than kind of their personalities or their, their campaign money. I mean, Bruce Rauner's been on TV for months now at this stage of this race, and we got a month left here, and there's no sign. I mean, he just... I think uh, he just got a few more hundreds of thousands of dollars mm -hmm. in these one lump sums from mm -hmm. from uh, from his friends, and so it's it's he has plenty more to, to keep going on on TV as long as he wants to. The the Dan Rutherford thing, uh, do you think that's damaged him? I mean, does he does he look like someone who's not actually able to operate his office effectively and all that? I mean, we should we should explain what happened here. Well, t Tony, I'm going to let you do that. Yeah. <laughs> it's a little... Uh, what happened? It's crazy. It's, 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 a, it's odd. It, it was just it was an a odd, strange bizarre press conference. press conference. He had a press conference a week ago saying um, there's go there, an employee is making allegations against me. They're, they're wrong, they're false, and they're being made... He's being put up to it by my opponent, Bruce Rauner. Any questions? <laughs> and, and, well, yeah, yeah, we have yes, a million have questions. Right it's, it's what, what are the, the allegations? What are the allegations? Right. Let's and start so, there. Let's Number start one. with that. Yeah. And uh, he said, you know, this for personnel reasons. This is an employee of the treasurer's office. We can't talk about it. And that, it, you know, it goes from there. And and now here we are a week later, and um, it's basically we've seen the uh, some blogs talk about it and post the. Post the, resi the the employee has now resigned mm -hmm. in question, but there might be more employees according to the attorney representing him. And so there's just, it, it sounds like there's two things that might be going on here. One is that he was being asked to do political work on, on state time, and the second thing is uh, sexual harassment or some sort of sexual harassment claims. But we don't know the details but of those no one knows at all. If either I, of that, those you know, is there's true. a big ca right, caveat with that. Correct me if I'm wrong, Tony, there is no lawsuit correct not no there's no lawsuit okay but so there may be one coming no, there may be one coming i've read so right, we've heard right. from the lawyer but right three yeah. days before the primary no yeah. i mean you know you don't you don't <laughs> right. know what right. you don't know what's going to happen here. Right. but i think it's going to be really hard for the public to make uh, an educated judgment in this race because the candidates are so similar from a policy standpoint yeah you're left to kind of sort out all well, the, the chicanery to the extent that they've attempted to debate each other the debates are just the i mean Forgive me for this, but they're just kind of snooze fests. I mean, they're, they're, they're really not debating very much because, as you say, they have very little difference between them. But, the, but you, of course, we've always had this impression from the beginning that it's really not four guys. It's three guys and one guy. It's the three guys against Bruce Rauner trying to stop the guy with all the money. And uh, that's going to be, I think that's going to be the question that's going to play out in the, in the primary is will Bruce Rauner be able to purchase the election or the, you know, the primary election? I, that, that, to me, that's almost like the only question there is. Well, and if you're, if you're Quinn on the other side, it, it, the, now the primary kind of becomes how do I wrangle the General Assembly? Right. And right. Uh, that's, that's kind of what his general election campaign is going to be judged on is kind of mm -hmm. what's going on right now. And right, right. So far, it appears to be uh, it could state be. of the state. <laughs> yeah, it could be a, a quiet session this time around. Um, the minimum wage issue, th that the last two times the General Assembly's passed a minim raising the minimum wage, it's been right around campaign season. Mm -hmm. um, and then they kind of staggered over the next few years. And so it, here we are right on schedule again for 2014 bringing up the minimum wage uh, issue again. Um, and then the other thing which I find interesting is, is just that, you know, the Senate president, John Cullerton, says our top issue this, this session is 
uh, pensions, again, this time for Chicago employees, mm -hmm. particularly, right. especially Chicago teachers. We solved the state's problems, now we're going to come in and solve Chicago, right? Well, the, that's the thing is, we don't know that they've solved the state <laughs> exactly. problems. Right. 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 There's, there's a lawsuit right now with all the right. unions. Right. And it's just, it's, it's, it, it's to, to do that in a campaign year when, when you have the governor that's going to be, I think, looking for a lot of these Chicago employees to be looking, you know, he's going to be wanting their support in his campaign. It's just going to be, it's going to be interesting to see if he gets their support, what ends up passing, what these bills look like. I mean, a lot can happen with these things uh, all in the next, in the next few months. Um, and it's just interesting how when they've tried to bring up Chicago pensions in the past, it's just, it's not gone over well at all. Why would, why would any state legislator even want to wade into that mess? I, I don't know. I mean, you know. Well, that's the thing is like a lot of the, the any representative who doesn't represent part of Chicago, if they're downstate, that, that's not much of an incentive, right, you know, right. that, that's not their, their turf at all. But mm -hmm. on the other side, you do have Rauner, whose view on pensions, correct me if I'm wrong, is even more, you know, I mean, he's basically yeah. kind of like, let's take them all away. Right, and, let's and just get rid of them all. Be yeah. a 401, we're going to have a 401k case, case right. system. So, you know, when you look at that, it's like they can take it so far to make it look like they're trying to do something mm -hmm. to help, you know, Joe Average, non-state city worker, mm -hmm. yeah. and yet still combat maybe the political message, the voter who might be drawn to Rauner, yeah, yeah. because he is more like, you know, I think a lot of people are work saying, well, I get a 401k, I don't get a pension. Mm -hmm. Why can't state workers and city employees get 401ks? And mm -hmm. obviously that... Of course, you also get Social Security if you have that 401k, mm -hmm. and these guys don't, and then all those arguments that we've, right, we've right, heard right. many times exactly. before. So, Pat Quinn, who has been declared politically dead more times than, <laughs> than you can count, even at this table, many times people saying he's, he's done, he's toast, there's not a chance for him, does this kind of rousing state of the state address where, I mean, his, his arms must have been hard, tired from hoisting up all those mission accomplished banners that, that he was uh, talking about. And, you know, it just sort of like it, it, there's a there's a he's got big mo. He's he's got people thinking that he's solving some big problems. Yeah, Illinois is making the comeback. Right. We turned the, the corner. It's the comeback state. Right. This is his theme of the right. of the state of the state address, which is just like kind of the, the state of the union, you know, for anyone mm -hmm. else. It's just it's and, and it wasn't any in terms of what he addressed for accomplishing this session. There wasn't one particularly really large overall theme other than what we've heard before about the minimum, raising the minimum wage. Um, he didn't really get into Chicago's pensions at all in that. Um, and so as a result, you just kind of were left looking at it, well, is this more of a campaign speech or not? <laughs> and there were certainly elements in there that you, you, we've heard, it's, you know, we've heard from Pat Quinn this type of tone before where it's, it's, it's getting at, he's quoting the Pope talking about economic <laughs> equality yeah, or talking yeah. about foreclosures still. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's things that you're, you can see him bringing, having this tone for the next year as he talks about his camp. I mean, I'm just remembering in 2010 when he had Bill Brady and he saw the ads about millionaire Bill Brady does this, mm -hmm. millionaire Bill right, Brady right. does this. Well, if, it's, if, if, the, if the nominee, I mean, we have Bill Brady still in the race again, so he could run those same ads again. Um, we have, you know, in this case too, Bruce Rauner, Bill Brady looks, you know, humbled compared to what Bruce <laughs> Rauner makes. What he can bring to the and table. so right. you can just see the ads there. So you, you already see that Quinn striking this tone about economic equality in, in mm -hmm. the state of the state. I'm sure that's going to be part of his budget address and we're going to keep hearing from that yeah, for the next seven yeah, months. Yeah. So um, we have to kind of be careful with our time here because um, we get we get so many things to talk about including David Kochman um, may I make the speech that you probably are too modest to make and say that one of the things that we always celebrate at this table is journalism and the professional practice of journalism and the Chicago Sun-Times uh, is to be just completely and and unequivocally congratulated for grabbing onto this bone and not letting it go all the way to the end. Now, whether the results were all that great is not the point. The point is that the, that the, the story got carried to the end and you were one of those people and I'm honored to have you at the table today. So Thank you, number one. Thanks for that. Uh, number two is I don't know that it's at the end. Yet. Right, right. And I think there's a lot in the web report that we're still uh, digesting. There's, there's enough to, to yeah. there will be other stories following out from it. it. it this is not like uh, reading a, a Harlequin romance novel uh, by any stretch of the imagination mm -hmm. given given the nature of what what happened uh, 
given how awful it is for everybody involved, from David Cashman losing his life to Nancy Cashman having to go almost 10 years uh, thinking that her son was to blame for his own death, mm -hmm. uh, to the Chicago Police Department leaving her with that impression, uh, to uh, a crime uh, in which Richard J. R. J. Vanecco, yes, is is he's going to jail for 60 days, 60 days of home confinement, 30 months probation. A lot of people think that's you know that's a light sentence, but when you also look at the amount of press coverage that an involuntary manslaughter case normally gets. Mm -hmm. Uh, compared to the amount of press coverage that this involuntary manslaughter case has gotten uh, because of who he is, a daily family member, a daily right. nephew, right. his life is, is, is forever changed. Uh, so, you know, it, it's, it's great to hear you say things like that, Ken, but in terms of like, you know, I, I don't want to leave people with the impression that we're all back in the newsroom uh, high-fiving oh, each no, other. Oh, no, no, and I, 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 didn't, I hope I didn't create that. No, no, and I, I don't I, think I, you did, but I just want to make that point clear to everybody because I think a lot of people, you know, a lot of people are saying, well, this crime would have never gotten charged if he wasn't the mayor's nephew, mm -hmm. uh, which is kind of bizarre because maybe that's the same reason he wasn't charged back when it originally right, happened. Right, so it's, right. it's a really complicated story, but what's clear in, in reading the web report is the web report is a very complicated document. It is it is 850 some footnotes. It's 162 pages. There is grand jury testimony smattered throughout both the report and the footnotes. And I think the press, when it first got it, just clung to that line in the press release. Mm -hmm. You know, there's no evidence that right. that Mayor Daley or family members uh, influenced the police department. Well. Mm -hmm. the, that's a press release line. It's not the line that's in the report. It's not actually in the report, right? right. So it's so so. Uh, let me ask you. There there are two questions that I think remain on the. Uh, well, there are many, but the two key questions that remain on the table uh, is the is the question about the mayor and what role the mayor, the mayor's office may or may not have had in it. And that has kind of been put to bed, but not entirely, I right. would guess. And the other, of course, is the question about the Chicago police and the Cook County State's Attorney's Office. And what, if anything, did they do wrong? Uh, and and is there will there be consequences if they did things wrong? And I guess from that, the question that leads out is, is especially the Chicago Police Department, are they just stupidly incompetent in, in, in this case and handling this case, or is it, is it corruption? And yeah. that's what still has to be worked through, right? Right, exactly. And I think, you know, the editorials in both papers in the wake of the Webb report kind of touched on those same issues. And Webb, you know, Webb gave us a preview when Vineco pleaded guilty on Friday, uh, a week ago, uh, that, uh, you know, he said, hey, I'm going to lay out the facts and leave it up for you to decide. Now, there are some, you know, reports where I, I think he had the latitude to make recommendations here. Um, he chose not to do that. Mm -hmm. But here's, here's what we know to kind of hit the highlights of the report. Um, we know that early on, independent of whatever the mayor knew, there is a, uh, an Area 3 lieutenant where this crime was being investigated out of that mm -hmm. said within perhaps hours, surely within a day or so, both he was aware of this incident and he had discussed it with his commander and mm -hmm. getting to one of your quotes of the week i think you know one of the quotes of the week is also in that report holy crap maybe the mayor's nephew is involved <laughs> that's true you know? yeah that, that we, is a quote of the week yeah. we, we know that when the detectives went out they didn't seem to be the two detectives that went out to interview uh Vineco's friend kevin mccarthy who's the subject of our story today you know Kevin McCarthy is is lying to them, telling them he doesn't know who's at the scene, but yet within that same kind of time frame, uh, it appears that the Area 3 brass going mm -hmm. up to the commander level is discussing that the nephew is involved. Fast forward, the police in their official reports that they gave us once this case was closed said, well, we didn't know that Vineco was involved for 18 days. Well, we all know now that that's complete. <laughs> that's a, that, that, yeah, that's a, yeah. that, how is that possible? Mm -hmm. It's impossible. Mm -hmm. And, uh, we and also, the mayor's office was notified. And the mayor and the mayor uh, did did say he was made aware at some point, but mm -hmm. then there's also another footnote in the report that talks about his deputy chief of staff for public safety mm -hmm. saying he was made aware shortly after mm -hmm. the incident. Right. He goes and talks to the mayor immediately, and there's a, a kind of a cryptic line in there in which he was left with the impression that that maybe the mayor had already known and maybe he didn't. Mm -hmm. So clearly. Something right, happens right. here and, and information is fanning out and how that can't color what happened given the way the story is played out in police mm -hmm, reports mm -hmm. and what we now know, there's, 
clearly there was some sort of, everybody was on alert. Everybody was on edge about yeah, this crime. Yeah. Well, of course, you know, the thing that, that we all like to speculate about is that I, there is a, there's a kind of an odd tie almost to the Chris Christie thing here because as somebody who worked in city government for a long time and worked for Mayor Daley in Mayor Daley's office, I can tell you that I honestly believe that Chris Christie never called anybody up or sent anybody sure. an email and said, hey, close that bridge, okay? You don't have to. When, when, you have a, when you have around you faithful people who, who believe they know what you want and how to handle your issues, uh, these things generate themselves spontaneously. Right. You don't, the, the, the big guy doesn't have to say anything. And I, I am quite sure that Mayor Daley never said to anybody, I want that killed. Call the police department and get that killed. He may never have even thought it, but it happened, or it appears well, that and, it happened. And the other thing he testified to was that he recused himself. Right, and then that right. leads to the question, okay, you're recusing self, but in this case, is recusing yourself the right thing yeah, to do, right, right, you right. know, given the fact right. pattern. I mean, you know, uh, it's the whole thing is just that, so that we know that now, but yes, mm -hmm. Ken, I think, and I think Ken, and uh, I think people have picked up on the fact that, you know, you don't need to make the phone call. Right, that's not right. how, that's not how things work. Flynn Taylor said that, right? It's like oh, in absolutely. Chicago, you don't need to yeah. make a phone call, right? Right. It's in the DNA. It just, it just spontaneously generates. So. The, one of the questions that I wanted to ask you that I haven't seen anywhere else is, if, if R.J. Vanecco had, let's just say, done the right thing, and the next day come out and said, look, I did this, I, I'm really very sorry for what I did, I'm willing to take my punishment for what I did, would the, would the legal system have prevented him from doing it? Is that really what happened? Yeah, I don't know that you can say that. I mean, I, you know, I, I think at some point here, R.J. Vanecco said when he apologized to Nancy Koshman that he felt bad about this from the beginning. For 10 years. For 10 years. Right. And then his lawyer, Tom Breen, stood up there and said, well, he wanted to apologize, but he couldn't because his lawyers wouldn't let him. Right. That would so, be us. You know, what what is going on? Behind the scenes, I mean, when this when this incident happened, you know, uh, Tim Novak and, and Steve Warmber and others were working on the hired truck story at City Hall, mm -hmm. and City Hall was kind of under siege it with was, publicity it was about in lockdown, that. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. on top of that, now you factor in this incident, and you can kind of see the motivation for for potentially why this thing needs to be swept under the rug because it would right. have created a whole new uh, layer yeah, of. Yeah. Of, uh, of problems over there. And police brass are like everybody else in the world too. They've got their jobs on the line and the last thing they want on their watch is to be the commander who, you know, nails the mayor's uh, nephew, right? So, yeah, I, I mean, mean, I don't mean to, I'm not pointing wait. to a specific person, but there's kind of a general sense of like, oh God, let's just make this go away. Well, when you look at the, tw the, the investigation from the point when Tim Novak filed his FOIA, January 4th, 2011, to what happened in those next months to kind of justify the investigation that happened the first time. There's mm -hmm. a lot of stuff about, mm -hmm. you know, there's a lot's been made about this line, bleep you, I'll mm -hmm. kick your bleep, that was attributed to David Koshman. Webb's report goes into it and says, we have no idea where right. this line came from. Right. It could have come from Kevin McCarthy, the guy who was in charge for obstruction, despite lying twice to the police that he didn't know Vaneco. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just like, and then at the end of that exchange in the report, the, uh, the line is uh, very nicely done <laughs> yeah. when yeah. that line's included. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Yeah. clearly, the, what it, Webb leaves you with the impression that the point of the 2011 investigation was to justify the 2004 investigation, which wasn't really an investigation to begin with. Right, right. So, Chris. Yeah. You and you guys together, Tony and, and Chris, worked on a very important series a while ago, and these are the kind of things that get swept down in these discussions, and I want to just make sure we have a few minutes to talk about this, about the rising number of deaths I among infants and children that are inside the world of DCFS, and the numbers are up. We've got to have to do it quickly, Tony. But sure. So, so what we've what we've done is we've gone over ten years of of child deaths in Illinois that, that have resulted from abuse or neglect. These are these are children who have died in which, and what we did was we went through those pretty much case, case by, by case. case. <laughs> Not pretty much. It was case by case, and um, and we looked at the circumstances of each one of them, and uh, we found that that. Um, in, a, in recent years, there have been more children who have been uh, killed by abuse or neglect when the parents had been investigated or the family had been investigated by DCFS in the, in the past year. So there have been contact there by the department, by somebody there, um, and still 
Uh, there were still problems enough in the home that, that a child died. And so um, and we have we've a been. a little bit of a graphic here. I, I just, this is yeah. just a screen grab. There's the, and you see sometimes. kind of a, a leak there in, in 2011. Now, what, what DCFS says is that part of the reason this number is up is because there have been, they're, they're classifying child deaths who are put in, um, children who are put in unsafe sleeping conditions. Mm -hmm. um, and so that recent classification, they're, they're now trying to basically penalize family members who put their kids in un, un, unsafe sleeping conditions. Mm -hmm. um, and so the way to do that, that kind of makes those, the, the numbers are lifted a little bit artificially. But if you look at that, you see still abuse. A, jump, abuse, a doubling. Yeah, I still see a doubling and you still see abuse, abuse deaths. But are, are, the, the one thing that I'm not clear on though is if you look at the dark red numbers, the number of, of abuse, abuse deaths over the 10 years mm -hmm. is not significantly different. It, it stays pretty much yeah. the same, right? It's the neglect numbers that have gone up. Right. Is and that th correct? I guess, but I guess that raises a couple questions too. I mean, okay, if the, if the change is a policy change to unsafe, unsafe sleeping conditions now constitutes neglect, mm -hmm. Well, then why weren't we counting that all along? Because those were right. those were going right. on all this time. Right, those were going on yeah. all this yeah. time, and they yeah. weren't being counted. Right. Should they be counted? Um, should there be a more stringent criteria as opposed to, hey, I was tired after I got home from work, the kid fell asleep on my chest, mm -hmm. as opposed to, I I, have, I was involved with DCFS before, I had some drugs in my system, I put the kid to bed, and you know he rolled off and fell and cracked his head. So there's just there's a lot of wiggle room here, yeah. and and the bottom line is is that the stories that Tony and I have, the individual stories where you have failures in the system, they are so horrific. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just one one of those is is eye popping, and it makes you wonder about other cases in the system where kids aren't dying. Mm -hmm. You know, just how the system right. is running. And that's that's part of why we did this because there, for ten years ago, the DCFS made a drastic policy shift to, to remove fewer kids from their homes mm -hmm. and since That's then there yeah. hasn't been a, a big evaluation of is that policy what's that what's that doing is, mm -hmm. it, is it working well and 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 we we looked at dcfs not just child deaths, we looked at a lot of different elements of DCFS, and that's this is the one a, that really popped out. To, that's been uh, a huge dynamic in DCFS, I mean, from the beginning, is this question about when do you take a child out of the family and what is the obligation to put the child back in? And I'm It's sorry. difficult. It's a, it's it's, a very, there's yeah. no good way to do right. child welfare. That, that's, that's one yeah, takeaway yeah, from yeah. this. Yeah. Uh, the other thing, though, is that DCFS's record keeping on child deaths is, is just been all over the board, and mm -hmm. that's one thing that I, I, I hope, at least at the very least, knowing the number of children who died statewide which they apparently weren't doing a great job of until we put this mm -hmm. issue front and center. Mm -hmm. Hopefully at least that's getting straight. There's out. a new director now, so we'll see see how that goes. I'm really sorry we've crashed again and <laughs> up against the walls of time. Um, Chris Fusco from the Sun Times, thanks so much for being on the show again. I hope to see you again. Tony, also Tony Arnold from WBEZ. And their work, all of this work is available online and you really should check it out. Check out the the Kochman stuff, the great website the Sun Times has done and, and your combined stuff on on DCFS, really worth looking at. You have been watching Chicago Newsroom. It's a community service of Can TV. You can see us right here on cable, but you can also watch us any old time you want by going to this address right here, watch us on YouTube, and I hope you'll do that because it's there all the time, and you can also subscribe to us as an audio podcast. So that's all we've got for this week. We'll be back again next week with another program. Hope you'll watch us then right here on Chicago Newsroom on Can TV. I'm Ken Davis. Thanks for watching. See you next week.